This an all out blitz. Real hard hits. The mother podcast trash. We gon' make them all quit. We cover all the topics with intelligence and logic. I know you wanna score, but ID gon' stop it. We from Texas. So that mean that we Texans. Breaking down the X's and O's, our profession. No complaining, just training. You see the progression. They had a pro bowl for talk shows. We get selected. We gon' celebrate every win like a birthday. Ray J with the news. First with all the updates. Spin move on the competition. Yeah, we juking them You not really in touch If you not tuning in This is Crenshaw, Briggs, and VT We want the touchdown We not trying to go for three And it's best if you get up out the street Cause them bulls out the pen And they about to stampede Hey everyone, welcome to the Texan Fan Battle Podcast as always, I'm your host, Matthew Briggs, tonight, and I got my amazing trio. We got a special guest, but let me introduce my guys to you. First off, I have A1 since day one. I got Mr. Crenshaw. What's going on, buddy? Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday, indeed. And always, we got our older but little brother, BT. If you ain't got no haters, you ain't popping. There you go. Guys, we have a special guest from 790 Sports Talk. The ho- co-host of the A team, we got Mr. Adam Wexler. How you doing, sir? Oh, great! Great to be with you guys. Thanks for having us. You've been enjoying the off season. Doesn't seem like we're in it anymore. So yes, oh, absolutely. It, it, it's been forever, huh? It just seems like slow motion. I'm ready for it to be in. So, well, let's kick off with some NFL news. So, uh, Colin Cowherd has said some stuff that has left, not to Texas fans upset, but sports fans and period. said he thinks CJ is going to be the only bust in the first round. And then he went on to mention other quarterbacks who will never re- re- reach the Super Bowl, including the late Dwayne Haskins. Um, you're our guest, so I'll start with you. What's your opinion of Poor taste. Oh, definitely it's in poor taste. With that many people involved in a radio slash TV show like that, there's no way that should ever happen. And I don't think that was how it was intended. But if it wasn't, you got to explain it a little bit better. It should have been acknowledged. He shouldn't have pointed out his name without saying anything about it as he lumped him in with a bunch of other poorly playing quarterbacks that are still either trying to be out there. But that's kind of the, the whole point of the graphic. Well, he's saying you can't win a Super Bowl with these guys. He had a bunch of guys that aren't even in the NFL anymore or guys that aren't starting. So clearly you can't win with them either. And just sprinkled in a few of the others. That's just who happens to be in the last, you know, 10 drafts, those 30 quarterbacks. But yeah, it's just typical poor taste. Uh, He says things in a powerful voice with confidence. So people think he knows what he's talking about. He obviously had a huge misstep there. The backlash that comes with it is fine. Nothing greater than that should happen. It's not some Twitter mob that should be uh, having him uh, you know, walk the streets and off the air. It was, it was in poor taste. It was insensitive. It was foolish. And it should have been acknowledged. As soon as he said it, he should have said something about it. Or as soon as they posted the graphic, at, if they hadn't already realized when they put it together, they shouldn't have done it like that. you got to at least acknowledge what is going on with that particular person since he passed away at age 24. So who knows what he could have done. Point is, it never should have been brought up that way. Uh, What Mm -hmm. they said about C.J. Stroud, that's a little bit different story. You know, he basically forced a topic that is kind of unnecessary. I got to pick one of these three guys that went in the top four, and one of them's going to fail. And then he said, well, I could see all of them failing. But the only thing that got picked out nationally was, or here locally, probably more importantly, is he picked C.J. Stroud out of the three. Uh, it, do you want to hear his reasons? He went to Ohio State, and he thinks the owners are clueless. So that's why C.J. Stroud's talent isn't going to win. Pretty much the whole segment laughable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you not see what's going on in Indianapolis right now? I mean, if if, we're, if our owners are that bad, uh, I don't know what you think about Indiana. So, yeah, I agree. BT, what, what about you? Yeah, I think the Dwayne Haskins remark was not just out of touch, but just gross. Um, The reason why I don't think it was just 
uh, a little mistake is because the graphic was incorrect. The graphic actually said quarterbacks that can make the Super Bowl, and he went out of his way to correct it. And that was the time where you could correct any other mistake you made. But he doubled down on Dwayne Haskins as he as he talked about him, as he read his name off the list. And as Adam said, he included other quarterbacks like Blake Bortles. Um, and other quarterbacks that aren't even in the league. And 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 now when we talk about the CJ thing, here's the thing that's just stupid, all right? This is what I call lazy, all right? Shout out to Lenny Locker because he knows I love him, but when I called um, when I called uh, Colin How- Cowherd lazy, he he came at me hard. And, and this is another way that I think that Colin Cowherd is lazy. He used as excuse, as Adam said, is that he went to Ohio State. But Seth Payne had a very great point. Um, And if you're not following Seth Payne on YouTube, you really need to. So there have been three Ohio State quarterbacks taken in the first or second round in the past 40 years. One of them is dead, Dwayne Haskins, who you can't really say anything about. Uh, Number two is you have Justin Fields, who's in his third year. Now, if you're calling him a bust in his second year, you're going to feel foolish like everyone else who called um, uh, Hertz and Josh Allen a bust as well. Because in their second years, people... Uh, question whether they should they should be a starter. So I think that, uh, first of all, Justin Fields' story has not been told. And then you have a quarterback that hasn't even taken a snap in the NFL. So based on those three quarterbacks, you're going to say Ohio State has, a, uh, has some sort of legendary bust mechanism? Yeah, that makes no sense to me. That's lazy. That's just going by, oh, this quarterback should work out because of where they came from. And you know that's not the case. Look at where Patrick Mahomes came from. Where, look where uh, Josh Allen came from. Lazy, lazy, lazy. I think it's time that people stop giving Colin Cowherd this emphasis about or, or this belief that he knows what he's talking about all the time. We, The reason why he makes the news a lot of times is because he makes mistakes. And his mistakes isn't because of just pure gaps. It's because he's not even trying to – Come up with the definitive reason why someone should be a bust. It, to me, it's just ridiculous. Crenshaw, I'll see you there with your Oh, I mean, it's 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 bad, man. I'm surprised his family never came out and said anything about it. Um, see, Colin gets more views for the wrong things than the right things he's saying. Um, and then I'm tired of the Ohio State quarterback narrative. I hope the CJ come out there and show everybody why he's number two pick. It's very, very lazy. It's really, really disgusting. I can't believe he said it. I'm like, what did he say? And I had to go back and replay it again. I was like, wow, that, that's crazy. But um, I hope he come out maybe tomorrow, apologize, make a tweet, do something to show some remorse. Don't just leave it blank like this. I agree. I agree. Well, moving on to the next subject. Um, Richard Sermon is rumored to be uh, taking uh, Sandy Sharp's spot with Skip Bayless. If anybody didn't see the clip years ago, uh, Richard Sermon did not like uh, Skip Bayless at all. So, interesting to see how that goes. Adam, are, are you ready to watch the fireworks? Are, are you excited? or are you, what, What's your opinion on it? Well, no offense to uh, Shannon and Skip. I didn't watch their show before, and I sure as heck am not going <laughs> to start watching it now. Richard Sermon's the better person on it, just like Shannon was the better person right. on it. Uh, so, right. they've really just replaced one person with another – but they haven't replaced the person they need to replace. If we, if we want to sit here and talk about how out of touch and lazy Colin Cowherd is, well, Skip Bayless can show him a thing. It's basically a hold my beer situation. Honestly, Richard Sherman, I, I can't imagine he doesn't hate him. And you brought up what happened many years ago, early in Richard Sherman's career, when he basically told Skip, he doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. He's done more with his two seasons of professional um, work than uh, Skip's done in his whole life. And I thought he was right then. And he's certainly right now. So I'm sure there will be fireworks. They will not like each other. It will get personal. It will have some of the same moments that Sharp did. They're probably going to create a little bit different mechanism for the show. Uh, I think we've heard a little bit about some of the other people that will be involved, maybe more of a a host situation, feeding them, much like they do on a first take. So maybe they're going to go for a little bit different formula. But the problem is one of the ingredients is Skip. And for as much money as they pay him and as much money as or as much interest they think there is, in his ridiculous takes and opinions, I think losing Shannon Sharp will ultimately lead to them not having this show at all or replacing all of the people that were once on it. And I I do want to get back to one thing that you brought up about uh, the other Ohio State quarterbacks. I made that very same point on our show, and the idea that the player picked first or second or third is of equal talent to the guy taking 12th or 15th 
or worse, 28th or 30th, they're all first round picks. And when you lump them all together, you clearly don't know what you're talking about. The only Ohio State quarterback that's ever been drafted as high as C.J. Stroud is C.J. Stroud. And nobody else is even close. He's in class by himself in terms of what the expectations are. They had a Heisman Trophy winner a couple of years ago get drafted by Baltimore at 174. 173 other players picked first. But Ohio State quarterbacks can't play in the NFL. That's what we're using for it. Lazy is a good word. Very lazy take. Yeah. I was about to say, you knocked that one out of the park. Thank you yeah, for uh, yeah. you know going back on that. Uh, BT, real quick, what, what's your take on Richard Sermon? Yeah, so I think Richard Sherman is awesome. Like, I like him. I, I love his podcast. I like when I can see him as a personality. Um, one of the things, though, is that if if you all don't remember that clip, I did post it on my timeline at Brown Shelby Bear if you want to check that out. But he murdered, murdered Skip Bayless. He, he, I mean, he, call, he called him a Cretan, ignorant. Um, I mean, every other word in the book, uh, politely so, and literally said that he was better than Skip Bayless in life. Uh, I mean, a very, very profound uh, couple minutes. But the thing is, on the show, yeah, it will get personal. The, I think that's what they're trying for. Um, what I what I need to actually see, though, is I need to see if he can stay as calm as in those two minutes because I've seen him get heated on a play, right? And and, I'm, and this is not a knock to Richard Sherman because, I mean, everyone sees him he gets heated over fucking plays. So, you know, it's not like he's alone here. But the thing is, Skip Bayless, I mean – Literally, if I was in the room with him, I might throw something at him. So I don't know how Richard Sherman can will, will be able to stay like Shannon Sharp, which was that even keel, you no know, matter when someone puts you down. Like he told Shannon Sharp, you are not good enough to Tom Brady. That's why you don't like him. You you sucked, basically. Um, you know, and, and he still kept an even keel. Can Richard Sherman do that? I'm not sure, but I'm de- I'm honestly going to watch. This is this is going to give me a, a lot of people a reason to watch a show at least for the first month or so. Crenshaw, speak to me, brother. What do you think? Um, that show is only going to last one year. I don't see Richard Sherman and Skip um, co co uh, They're they're not going to do it at all. Um, why does he stay out of the show? Like, why is he still on TV? What, what is the reason for him to be on TV? Does, does he know something that we don't know? Is he got someone kid hostage or something? Like, he should be off TV because his tastes are ridiculous, man. I, I don't really too much like the guy. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I only watch the show because of Shannon, but like him, I don't really, really like what he does. I, I see he's trying to do a lot of hip hop in the show and everything, but to me, that's not. Either, especially so. his take uh, uh his twitter rant about demar hamlin like that should have been enough to uh you know get him off get him off of something right like come on man that was way way too far way yeah too it's, it's it's time to retire i mean they need to just put adam russell in that spot and we would all be happy <laughs> all right guys well let's jump to why we are here you're high with me the slide with me you feel like 550 on the fly stick you can get high with me that's a deal right ride with me if you're last day of camp number 11 uh cj stroud started off pretty rough yesterday but he had a bounce back day today uh the reports are saying the offense won the day and D'Amico was not happy. Uh, Adam, tell us your whole text of camp. What what, what impressed you? Uh, are you excited? Uh, what what is your big worry? Like, tell us all of it. What what do you think about the Texans so far? Uh, the offense has been ahead of the defense, uh, pretty much not at all uh, during this camp. Now I don't. They've been you know a little bit better than I think you'd expect for a team that's all new, new quarterback, new offense, new defense, new head coach. But the defense is per normal is ahead of the offense. Uh, I think they'd slowed them down most of the way through camp. And again, the first four days plus with no pads, I'm not really putting any stock in that. We're out there every day. And again, they go through it, but there's not much to look at there. After they put on the pads, after they start going for real in practice, uh, in 11 on 11s, 7 on 7s, you start to see one on one work uh, with the DBs and the, and the wide outs and the linebackers and the tight ends, et cetera. You can actually start seeing what kind of talent they have. And it is a significant difference from last year and the year before obviously when Nick Casario is actually trying they might have a chance to put a team together you know first two years the free agents they signed were street free agents they wouldn't have started anywhere in the league but they were starting here 
That changed this offseason. They have legitimate players, not necessarily disruptors, game changers, all pro caliber players, but legitimate NFL starting caliber players, both sides of the ball. And I think both of the last two years drafts have been really, really good. And those are the players that should be the best players for this team, uh, probably starting as soon as this year. Obviously, CJ and Will, but Jalen Petrie and Derek Stingley Jr. and Christian Harris and Damian Pierce and John Mechie, I think all of these players are the foundation of if this team is going to be good, it's going to be because of those players. I think the quarterback decision, it was probably made before they got to camp, but they had to let it play, or they felt like they needed to let it play out. And I think it did. I do think he's earned the right to get the reps. I think he has outplayed Davis Mills, but take that with a grain of salt. This is training camp stuff. Outplaying him is it's a relative term and it's not by much and it's nothing significant, but it also doesn't matter. It makes no sense to draft CJ Stroud, not get him all the work in practice, not have him ready to the joint practices and not have him ready for the opener. They, they don't need to see Davis Mills play unless they're forced to, and they're not. They need to see CJ Stroud play. And that's exactly what's going to happen in Baltimore. I doubt he plays a whole lot uh, tomorrow night because I don't think a lot of the players that can protect him will be out there. But uh, the joint practices, honestly, they got four joint practices, three preseason games. I promise you, of those seven events, the most important four of them are two practices against Miami and two practices against the Saints, not the preseason games. Okay, I, I like it. I like it, VT. Yeah, I mean, I, I have some difference of opinion. I agree on the whole QB competition. I agree with you 100%. It was already a known quantity that – Basically, Stroud was going to play week one, both in preseason as, and as well as in Baltimore. Where I disagree is when you talk about the talent, because I think on the defensive side, particularly, that we potentially do have some pro bowlers, and that's in Will Anderson, Will Anderson and in Jalen Petrie. I've been preaching up and down for months now that Jalen Petrie literally had an all-pro year last year. He had five interceptions, 147 tackles, a sack. Um, and, and so I think that he really showed that he is an all pro caliber player. I think right. the, biggest the, the issue, talent that I was talking about was strictly the additions via free agency and trades, gotcha, not the gotcha. draft class. Cause you brought up two guys that I totally agree with. Okay. Yeah, okay. And Will Anderson better be a pro bowler, but right. everything I've seen suggests he will. And I think it was just on today's show. I said, Jalen Petrie, I'm not wondering what he will be. I'm, it's case closed. I'm already sure this kid can play. This guy's going to go. be All right. So we're on the same page then. Yeah. All right, so then then I agree with that. Now, as far as the you know camp is concerned, again, I'll agree there that the defense won most days. It looks like from what everyone's out there, they said day eleven really was the only real day where the offense um, won. And D'Amico in the press conference was visibly upset about the defense. Actually, talked about him, um, said that he wasn't that happy, and and so I don't think that's because the offense just had a crazy good day. I think the defense just wasn't. That normal speed. For what reason? I don't know. We'll we'll see um, what happens with that. But I I agree that the defense is is really going to be the soul of this team. My concern on offense, my biggest concern, and it's been this for a couple months, is the interior offensive line. Now I think Titus Howard comes back week one or latest week two around there, so I'm not too worried about the right tackle position. But where I'm worried about is a left guard position and the center position. Uh, Kenyon Green had a bad year last year. Um, and that's being generous. Um, Malik Collins had his way with him in camp. Um, he did make some good uh, run blocking plays. He was okay in pass protection here and there. But every once in a while, he gets run over. And um, you know we're going to go against some of the best defensive tackles in the league this year. So I'm worried about Kenyon Green and Juice Scruggs. He's a rookie. Scott Quesenberry was taking most of the snaps in, at once, not Juice Scruggs. And so those two individuals, in my opinion, control the offense this season. If they can't keep, if they can't keep Stroud upright for three seconds, it's going to be a problem. The only good thing that that I'm going to say about that, however, is that Stroud actually looks like he has gotten better week to week. Before he was holding on the ball too long, and you would have had three or four sacks. It would be sacks in a particular game. In a particular practice, now he's actually getting the ball out quicker. Instead of three seconds or three point two, he's actually getting the ball out in two point five, two point seven. You know, these are estimates from the beat reporter, so no one can say with any certainty. But nonetheless, he's getting the ball out faster. So I think that's a plus. But again, the biggest thing that I th that's going to limit the offense is not the wide receivers. It's not even the quarterback. 
It's a left guard and center positions. And unfortunately, during preseason, we're not going to get the best out of that because we're not going against the top-tier talent on the Patriots side the whole game. And, of course, we have injuries on the offensive line, uh, and Tunsil is, out, is not going to play a, a ton, uh, you know, if, if at all, really. But so, so that's my concern on offense. All right. Chris, I'll speak to us, Bubba. Well, actually, I just got a couple questions right now for Adam. Um, how is Nico Collins looking, and how is Stingley and Stephen Nelson looking to you in camp? I think Nico Collins, for, for what I think he can be, uh, he, he should be excited about the camp he's had. I, I still hesitate to elevate him to – true number one status he'll be their number one he'll be their number one target down the field he is there should be their number one target in terms of red zone plays because of his size that nobody else on this team has uh xavier hutchinson's close jared wayne is close but wayne probably won't make uh the original 53 um they're gonna run a little bit different look in the red zone so i'm sure robert woods and tank and mechie will find a lot of openings underneath and i'm sure dalton schultz will be a popular target but if they're running any fades, if they're running running any go up and get it plays, it's only Nico Collins. And he's excelled in that regard so far this camp. He's gotten behind defenders, uh, beat Shaq Griffin for a long touchdown, uh, beat Derek Stingley for a long touchdown, passes from both of the two quarterbacks on those respective plays. And if there have been shot plays at camp, he's basically been on the target end of all of them. Not all of them have been complete. And the best part about camp is the majority of the time uh, he has been – uh, the core, uh, the quarterback's best friend, so to speak, he's been defended by Stingley. They're making each other better, and that's what I, I hoped to see. I think Steven Nelson's a little underrated. I think he's a, a good second corner, uh, especially for what they're paying him, even with the extra money he uh, squeezed out of Nick. Uh, but I think they're perfectly well set. That's probably the most sound position group on the entire team uh, because both of their slots, I think, are excellent. I think King probably is running ahead of Tavier, but I think they provide different things. And depending on who they're playing and what players they have to match up with, will kind of determine which one of them is the true uh, third corner. Uh, but Derek Stingley Jr. was probably healthy enough to play football later last season, and they just decided for the future of him and the future of this team, there's no reason to bring him back. He needs to be out there this year. And it's not a competition between him and Sauce Gardner. To me, it will be to everybody else. Just go out there and show you deserve to be a top five pick. And that's what I expect him to do. Oh, man, couldn't say any better. I hope you're right. I hope everything goes to plan. We've been saying that the secondary is the highest we say is top eight. Uh, VT says top five. And what, what would you rank the defensive secondary? As of now, right now. I mean, as a whole, because now you're adding in their their best two guys, because Petrie and Ward as a duo, is that's probably an even better duo than Stingley and, and Nelson uh, as it relates to the corners versus the safeties. But mm -hmm. that's a pretty lofty spot to be in. And some of that's also going to be dictated on, are they getting any help up front? Are quarterbacks mm -hmm. being forced to throw quickly? Are quarterbacks being hit when they throw, which should result in turnovers and, and uh, drives that get stopped? I think that's where you're probably not going to see them able to elevate into that super high level. And you also got to consider where they're coming from. There's just too many other teams that were better than them, didn't make any changes with their personnel or defense. There's really no reason for them to drop off. One little caveat there is the Texans play some really not very good quarterbacks this year, and they should be able to take advantage of that. So that might skew some of their numbers in their favor. I like them, but I don't know that they can elevate their – their unit as a whole quite that high. Okay. Well, I guess respect. Uh, so as we talk, we got tomorrow night, we got the New England Patriots at New England, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so we got the depth chart of now. Adam, tell me, what do you expect from the starters? I, I'm, we all know that they're not going to play a full, uh, you know, full reps. But what do you expect from the starters and the backups? And is there any surprises – on the depth chart that caught your eye. Well, keep in mind, every time you bring it up this week, the next two preseason weeks, and any of the 17 regular season weeks, there's one word in there. It's called unofficial. It's right. not like the team is sitting down, printing this out, sending it to the PR staff and saying, can you slap this in the game notes? It's not like that at all. It happens to be accurate. Uh, when you look it over and based on what they've been running out there in practice every day, it is accurate. Uh, the players that they have listed there, for the most part, 
have played these roles throughout camp. The one thing I would say is they have Will Anderson and John Grenard on opposite sides with that number one group. Most of camp, Grenard and Hughes have been opposite of each other with Anderson and Martin working in behind them at those respective spots. They're going to rotate, so I don't think it means a thing. I think you're going to see different groups with each other. You're going to see different groups at the ones and at the twos. But those are your top four edge rushers at this point in camp, and I'd be really surprised if that changed considering the guys behind them. Those are their clear number uh, top four. They have a clear top four on the interior as well, and that, again, is accurately listed with Rankins, Ridgeway, Collins, and Roy Lopez. But again, truthfully, the way camp has gone through these 11 practices – the most often started duo has still been Lopez and Collins. I think eventually by Baltimore, it's going to be Rankins and Collins, but we're not going to see a whole lot of, if you're a veteran, especially those even brought in that know this defense, they're not going to be out there against whomever uh, Bill O'Brien decides to put out there on offense uh, for the Patriots this week. Like I said, I think they're going to get very limited reps. And then when they have joint practices, They're going to get 30 snaps, 35 snaps, 40 snaps, ones versus ones, which can all go simultaneously on the two separate practice fields. That's the work they're going to get to prep them for the season. All right. Man, I like it. Chris, I'll start with you. Um, As as far as as far as tomorrow, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I really want to I really want to see CJ play at least four or five series. Um, I really don't want to see Davis Mills at all. I I know what he can do, but uh, unfortunately, we have to see him. You know, I hear a lot of trade rumors, but I don't see them trading that guy. Just keep him as a backup. Um, I really want to see Xavier, man. Like, like that's my guy. I really think he's going to take over on um, Nico Collins' spot. I just don't really think Nico Collins is that good of a player. He's more of a two or a three, but they're making him to be a one, but I just don't see it, you know. Um, the interior line, you know, like VT always preached, man, that, that's that's going to be – that's going to be – that's going to make and break us this year. If we can't get that line right, we're not going to go anywhere. Um, I think Dalton Show is going to be CJ's best friend this year, and I, and I hope so. Um, Adam, let me ask you a question. What have you seen from Bobby? Because I don't know anything about the, the guy. What have you seen from Bobby that we don't know since we're not there every day like you are? Who are you talking about? Bobby, Bobby Sloak. Um, um, oh, Bobby Sloak? Um yes. What we get is mostly from the players. Now, we did get a chance to talk to him. Uh, the, one of the questions I asked Case Keenum just the other day was, how would you describe his offense? What is he trying to do? And he said, well, his offense is basically the greatest hits album of the West Coast offense. Mm-hmm. And that is right in line with what all the other offensive players have been talking about, and even some of the defensive players. Super aggressive. He's trying to get people moving down the field. Um, not necessarily shot after shot after shot, but they're going to push the ball down the field. The, the, the thing that you, you get a get a sense of, but you really can't see in camp, is they're still built for the run. They're, they're still going to try to you know keep their defense rested, move the chains with the run. I think they know what they have in Damian Pierce, and they have a very competent backup in Devin Singletary. They're going to be able to move the bo- football with those guys to be able to move the chains. And then I think you'll see them try to get the ball in the hands of their playmakers down the field. You know, I, I will say in, uh, in Hutchinson's case, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. He's made a ton of plays. I, I think he's got a, a work to do to move up the depth chart, but I also don't think he's in any jeopardy of not making the team. That's what makes this group that they have. I mean, it's an interesting group, but there's not much for anybody to, to aspire to be. Nico Collins is going to make the team. Robert Woods is going to make the team. They drafted John Mechie, and he hasn't been out there. He's obviously going to make the team. Xavier Hutchinson and Tank Dell just drafted. They're going to make the team. That essentially could be your entire group moving into the opener. There's probably one other spot, and it's probably pegged to be Noah Brown. I actually think he needs to show a little bit more over the next three weeks to ensure that he gets that spot. But I think people will be pretty happy with what they see from Sloak. The the biggest question is – he can have a great playbook. He can drop some uh, interesting things at practice, but he's never called a game before in live action, getting the plays in on time, knowing what needs to be run, reacting to what has been happening, adapting to what he's seeing and making those adjustments all within that time frame. I mean, we saw a head coach last year try to do it in Denver, and it was a disaster with Nathaniel Hackett. Now, Sloak's not the head coach, but being a first-time play caller, 
it's challenging. And and that's obviously one other thing to watch for uh, Thursday night and the following week against the Dolphins and then against the Saints. How does it look like they're able to operate with someone who's never called plays before? Mm. If, if, it's, if it's one thing that CJ could work on, what do you think it is? Probably just the speed that he goes through his progressions. The only thing that's really stood out in, in that regard is I, I think he, he has held on to the ball a lot, uh, but it, it probably can play to the Texans' advantage, and he finally was able to show it against Georgia. He's going to have no problem at all, I don't think, moving the football with his feet. They're not going to design a lot of plays for that. They will probably have the read option in the offense. I don't know that they'll run it very often, but he will scramble for positive yards way more than I think people thought he would be capable of from watching him at Ohio State, where he basically just stood back there and picked apart defenses with his wide open, super talented receivers and unbelievable offensive line. When it was kind of equalized against the talented uh, Bulldogs team, he showed that he is much more capable with his feet, extending plays and being able to have the arm strength to get the ball down the field while on the move. So I think making sure he does get to that second, third, fourth read before he tucks it and runs, as I, I could say that about any rookie quarterback, probably, but that's an area where he probably needs to work the most. And I, I think, you know, throwing a clean ball, a little bit uh, tighter spiral, a little bit more accuracy. Again, we're talking about 11 practices plus an offseason. He never played in a game before. Let, let's let him do that, see what is out there, and then go off what needs to be corrected. Yeah, I love how you said, you know, he what he did against the Georgia Bulldogs. I mean, he basically played the Philadelphia Eagles defense. <laughs> So, you know, so you know, that, that's a plus. BT, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I agree with a lot that has been said. I just want to uh, touch on a few different things. Number one, Kuncho, you mentioned Hutch. What I think is interesting is that um, they, for the first time in his life, he's going to be playing on special teams. And I think that that's the way he's going to creep up to, become, to get more snaps in on offense. Um, Noah Brown played a lot on special teams in, in Dallas, and then when the time came, he stepped up and became a you know um, a receiver, obviously on offense. So I think we'll see that with Hutch. Um, that's something that he, you know we will see more and more of him. I think that what's interesting also is they played Hutch in the slot. Now this is a big guy, but he's playing in the slot. Now he played everywhere, obviously, but um, but when when the fact that he's playing on special teams, he played in the slot. He can be X, Y, and Z, really, depending on what you're calling. Then I think the versatility of Xavier Hutchison is why I think eventually down it later in the season that where he's going to get more snaps on offense. So uh, I'm really looking forward to see his progression. He was a six round pick, and I think a lot of people are just throwing him away essentially because of how late that we drafted him. But I think he's going to be electric when he gets his shot. And I can't wait to see what he does in the preseason and hopefully gets more snaps in the offense. Um, one of the things that I've heard people say about Stroud is not just that he's gotten quicker with the football, get a release, and, and, and but the issue is that he can actually sell the play action. Last year, I, I said on this uh, podcast many times and on Twitter and on Twitter spaces is that one of the things that I did not like, and listen, there were many things I didn't like about Davis Mills, but one of the biggest ones is that he never could sell me play action. That like... There are players when I'm watching it, I am my eyes are already switching because I don't think they have the ball anymore. Like you're fooling me watching it on TV. And Davis Mills, not once did he ever, ever sell me on a play action. That's different with CJ Stroud. He can sell the play action. By being able to sell the play action, he's going to be able to get the ball out um, downfield, which is something that Davis Mills never was able to do, which is why when he tried to sell that play action, he had to he failed. He he could not. He could not convert on third down. So I think that those are some of the, the big differences. As far as preseason goes, I, I think they're going to have Judon out there. That's what it looks like out on the Patriots' side. Um, what that means is that we'll see how our offense re uh, 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 our offense responds to Judon. Um, they'll have dribble peppers out there. So it's not like we're not going to see the Patriots out there with just, um, you know, third stringers. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll see something out there, but I agree also again with Adam saying that, you know, that Dolphins defense is strong. That's when we'll see a lot on, on how this offense actually is going to, uh, perform throughout the season. But I do think that this preseason is going to tell us a lot. It's going to, it's not going to tell us a lot on how, 
on how the offense is going to be run because it's going to be very vanilla. And Bobby, but it will give time for Bobby Slovak to actually be that play caller for the first time when the lights are on bright and when he can actually show what he's got. So that's what I'm all. All these things, you know, these little bits and pieces of CJ Strong play action. Uh, Hutch, uh, seeing him on special teams, seeing what snaps he can get, um, seeing how, how they perform against this Patriots defense. There's little bits and pieces that I want to see. Obviously, I don't really give a crap of who wins and loses. It's it's preseason. It's time to try shit around. But I want to see how these little things get done. And I'm, I'm going to be paying very close attention to it. Adam, is there anything you'd like to add from what these guys said? No, it's a great opportunity for all these players that aren't starters because they're the ones who are going to get most of the snaps. They're the ones that are going to be out there, try to stay healthy and, and show that what they've shown the coaches in training camp is what they can do when the lights are on and what they can do against a, another team, which is obviously something I think this team is ready uh, to see. I do think they have to be careful with with what they have going on with their offensive line. Uh, and honestly, we, we hardly ever talk about it, it's, is the tight end situation. They have right. eight tight ends right now because four of them can't play. Four of them aren't healthy. And after Dalton Schultz, their number two tight end and number three tight end basically haven't practiced at all at camp. So manipulating your way through a game in an offense that would like to use their tight end, Dalton Schultz, who missed a handful of practices after colliding with Jimmy Ward, but is fine now, probably doesn't need to be out there very much, which means you're going to have a possibly every snap taken at tight end after Dalton Schultz could be coming from a guy who doesn't make this team. Uh, that's right. how badly uh, situated they are from a health standpoint. Uh, but it's just something to keep in mind as you're trying to operate this very vanilla offense. Keep in mind in preseason games, they don't really game plan. You're not looking at what the Patriots do and working right, off that. You're just working on your own stuff. Right, right. Yeah, every every offense is going to look uh, vanilla. I mean, I, I, you know. Sorry about that. I just wanted to add. Um, so we're talking about players that are getting snaps, and this will address us and also ask you a question. Jacoby Francis actually was supposed to be on the show tonight. They got some last-minute uh, schedule changes. We'll actually be having him on Friday, um, so we'll be doing that. So I apologize to everyone that wanted to uh, catch Jacoby Francis. We will have him on Friday, though, so don't worry about that. But I want to know, of, of the dudes that are out there, so I, my question is, I'd like you to comment on Jacoby Francis, but also since you mentioned the tight end group, do you think that Brevin Jordan makes his squad? Because I understand he's a little banged up right now, but based on what he did in camp, um, you know, he didn't really drop the ball as much. That's the, that's been his biggest problem. Um, we know he can't pass. Um, he can't block, but we need a receiving threat at the tight end position. Do you think the lack of depth gives him a position on this team? Or do you think that he, you know, when you say who the tight end three is, who do you think that tight end three is? Because I'm thinking that's Brevin. I mean, the depth issue is is purely an injury issue. I mean, Schultz, Quintoriano, and Brevin Jordan, it better be the top three. Uh, but, I mean, I don't know what they're looking at from camp because there's nothing to see. Brevin Jordan hasn't been out there. He hasn't practiced right. in probably the last seven practices. So there's nothing really to see from him. He hasn't practiced when they've had pads on. Uh, so this particular coaching group, they saw him during the offseason, but they haven't seen much from him since. So if he's not healthier and not able to go against the Dolphins or Saints, I don't think that helps his cause at all. I don't think they really care who the other tight ends are because they're all roughly the same. I mean, Nick Vanette and Dalton Keene and Eric Tomlinson, you know, bigger guys, two of those three. Uh, I think they wanted to see what Jordan Murray has, uh, but he's been hurt for the last couple of practices. So uh, I, I think they're hopeful that Quitoriano will get on the field sometime after this preseason game, he's been rehabbing and he's probably not very far away. But honestly, in Brevin Jordan's case, he's definitely not one of the top two unless injuries dictate that. And unless he goes out there and shows that he can help this team, I'm not sure that this group of coaches, offensive coaches, really have much invested in a player that you know, was drafted a couple of years ago, has not been healthy, has been a, a healthy inactive at times. I don't think there's a huge reason other than he doesn't make much money, but none of them do uh, to have him here. I would like to, to see something happen. We just haven't. He just hasn't elevated his play. But part of that is the fact that he's just simply not on the field. Best ability is availability, right? Like you got, I mean, even last year, Reverend Jordan missed a lot of games. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that changes because we got to see something, right? You got to have some kind of uh, uh showcase to see what, what we need to do. Uh, the guy I'm I'm excited for tomorrow, uh, I hope he gets a little bit more reps, 
is uh, Valade. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think they have him fourth or fifth uh, string running back. Uh, I hope he he climbs his way and passes the other guys. Uh, all, everything I heard from training camp, the dude's speed is just phenomenal. So hopefully, uh, hopefully he climbs. I, I love a true underdog. I'll tell you yeah. what, in, in his case, from, from what I've seen and from what he did at, at Arizona State, bigger player. He, he's mm-hmm. definitely the biggest player they have among the reserves. I think he has very good hands out of the backfield, which is a very good fit for this offense. And I think the other players, I mean, technically they have six running backs, and he's number six. He's been running number six all camp. He's going to get a ton of work in this game. Mike Boone is ahead of him. He's a veteran. He's going to play special teams or he's not going to be on the team. He's probably not going to get carries, so to speak, over him unless obviously he's not active. Um, Jared Dokes, he's he's not going to make this team ahead of Valaday, but technically right now on the depth chart and how they've been practicing, he's ahead of him. They have much more hope for a guy like Valaday than either of those two guys. And again, I'm not sure how to categorize Dario Gumbawale because I, I think they just value him for being, you know, he's a veteran player. They know what they're going to get. He's been running with the threes. He would be active on game day if this is the group they go with into the season can also play special teams, and he's good out of the backfield. But there's nothing different than any other team's third or fourth string running back. That's why Valade has a chance to be better, to show them something more, and to actually put himself in position to I mean, either grab the very last spot or maybe they stop using him so they can sneak him through waivers and put him on the practice squad. I think they're pretty sure they want him a part of this team moving forward. If it's not part of the 53, then certainly it's part of the 16 player practice squad. And uh, I think he he's the type of players they should have been adding to the roster post draft every year. And they basically didn't add any of them. This is the first year they're actually trying. Yeah. That's what it seems like. Right. Uh, and another one that I've been uh, interested to see is Blake Cashman. Uh, ooh, I guess ooh. he's taking everybody by storm. Uh, they, they said that he is, part of the starting linebacker core. Uh, Adam, is that a guy that caught your eye? or? Well, one of the this... reasons why you'd see him listed as a starter is because Kirksey has not been practicing. He was out there for the first few days, has a, m- a minor leg injury, but he has not returned to the field. Uh, Henry Toto is another player who's elevated. Uh, those two players, along with Harris and Perryman, those are your best four linebackers. Those are the guys that should be on the field almost exclusively on game day. A lot of two linebacker sets with the five DBs, so that kind of – makes it a decision to make who's playing with Harris. But Blake Cashman is just the type of player that's kind of on the fringe that is making sure they don't cut him. He's making plays. He has quickness. He has speed. I think he actually showed pretty well late last year when he was given the opportunity. Uh, He has been very good in coverage, which almost every team needs. This team certainly does. Uh, So he's done everything he needed to do to make sure uh, he was not, in my opinion, in any jeopardy he'll help him on special teams as well and has since he came here last year um he's definitely a player that they will want uh not only in that group but uh he should probably be among the active players every week because he can play special teams because i think they like how he's shown uh toa toa is the, the kind of the wild card i know they loved him at the draft but i think he's actually outperformed what their expectations were and he's a definitely near the very top of the list on players to watch anybody who's never played before a rookie go see what they can do they got to give him snaps he's earned all those snaps and he can definitely play himself into position of being a, an actual key performer uh, for this team this year so piggyback off of that um do you think Kirksey is in jeopardy of being cut or his is his spot still no way he's gonna be off the team uh, he's in jeopardy only because he makes a little bit of money. Obviously that could help you both this year, potentially next year and and the ability to stay on the field. Is, it matters. Uh, I don't think they need his veteran leadership anymore. And that goes into them again, trying in free agency. You got veterans all across the defensive line, uh, pretty much everybody except for Will Anderson. You got veterans across the, the secondary. And I include Petrie in that and Stingley in that. Uh, so as a whole, as a culture setter, he, he might have been in position to do that last year with their awful culture, and there's nothing he could do about it, but they don't need him for that this year. They need him to play, and every player we just talked about, including Cashman, uh, quite frankly, probably helps this team on the field more than Kirksey does. Mm. All right. Well, guys, do you have any other questions for Adam before we move to the last segment? Yeah, let yeah. me talk about that linebacker court for just a moment. Um, so you mentioned, uh, uh, obviously, uh, Henry Toa Toa. Something that we've been hearing is that um, 
your pyramid should be the mic, but that they have been playing Toa Toa at mic and they liked what, what they've seen. Right. Do you think that they start um, kind of the transition to try to move him in that mic position come late in the season? Do you think that's something that they're trying to do next off season? Cause it seems like the plan is that they, that they want to move him as a mic position. The question that I want to ask is one, well, that's part one of my question. Part two is that, do you think that his just body, his physique, the fact that he's a little light is one of the reasons why they're waiting to put him in that position. It's interesting because I think you're right that he's light, but he's light in his upper body. He's not light in his legs. And uh, so I just think that's a matter of a year from now, he'll have that, that issue. If it is one a totally different scenario, I think he'll be one of their bigger linebackers when he is able to, you know, spend an off season as an NFL player, they signed Perryman to play. Uh, and he's going to be starting at Mike. I think there's no reason not to unless he gives you one. I think he brings thump. The other guys bring speed, and they want that. They want a veteran player. They want a player who's been on some good defense, who's played with some very good players. He definitely brings an attitude uh, to the field. Uh, he and Jimmy Ward, amazing. We've gone through almost this entire podcast. and haven't mentioned maybe the most important non-drafted <laughs> player uh, addition to the defense because Jimmy Ward is going to be great for these guys. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, Starting, you know, Mike linebacker and D'Amico's defense in 2024 very well could be Toa Toa. And I think they'll just you know, walk their way through the season and see what makes the most sense from a snap distribution and, and whether or not it really makes sense to actually make that switch. Again, we're high on a player. He's had 11 training camp practices. He's never seen another team. I think uh, they, I don't know if we have to pump the brakes. I don't know if we're even in the car yet, but gotcha. you know, give him a chance to get out there on the field. I, I like what I've seen. But it's got to be against another team. It's it's not so obvious and jumping off the page that he's some unstoppable force that we already know. He's just got to go out there and be given the chance to prove that he can play, and, and I'm sure he will. Okay, fair enough. Turn so you had a question? Oh, I was going to ask him uh, how many games you got the Rockets winning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I could take the easy route and say more than 22, uh, but I think it'll be significantly higher than that. Uh, it's weird that they didn't really add these unbelievable veteran players, these you know push you over the top players. And and the way I've described it is the best players on the Rockets for this upcoming season were all already on the team. Fred Van Vliet should not be the best player on the team. Same with Dylan Brooks and any other veteran player they brought in, and probably not the next best player either. This team has to be led by Jalen Green and KPJ and Jabari Smith and Alperin Shingun and Tari Eason. Those have to be the best players on the team. How these newcomers help make that happen is how this team is going to get a lot better. I think Vegas is probably pretty accurate. Most of the places have it around 32 and a half. Uh, I would take the over, but they probably won't get there till the final week of the season. Mm. Hey, that, right. That's fair right there. I like it. All right, me too. Well, Adam, before we sign off, uh, everybody's heard me and Crenshaw and BT's predictions of the season. Uh, I know some guys don't like to do it. So if you don't like to do it, we understand. But what is your season predictions for the Texans this year in 2023? It kind of takes me back to the question when we were talking about where can their secondary rank? Well, how can they win games? Well, they can win games by beating Kenny Pickett and Desmond Ritter and whomever the Arizona Cardinals are starting and the Colts starting a rookie quarterback and Bryce Young and the Panthers starting a rookie quarterback. Go out and win some of those games. Even if you just split those games, that's five wins maybe. And maybe there's another game against a reasonably good team that you can also beat. What is Tennessee really trying to do this year? I think we'll know by the time the Texans see them. They don't play them until uh, week 15, until the day before Christmas. By then, mm -hmm. the Titans will either be in the hunt or – trying to figure out who they need to play at quarterback in the upcoming season. You might see Will Levis twice because you're not playing them until week 15 or and week 17. So I think that number can actually be much higher than maybe even their talent is. Uh, same thing if, if we look at Vegas, that number is maybe five, five and a half. I think they will sneak over that. And that's what we've been saying too. We've been saying about six, seven is the average. And I know that's fair. Uh, I, I, we think that 2024 and on, is the years the Texans are going to shine, and that's when it's going to take place. So, well, Adam, man, it's been an honor for you to come on. Thank you again. Uh, it's, it's been a fun episode. Why don't you tell everybody where we can find you and what you got cooking on Sports Radio? 
Well, you know you can find me at Sports Talk 790 every weekday afternoon from 3 to 6. Also on our iHeartRadio app, same story. And all across the social media channels at Adam J. Wexler. And that includes for the kids on TikTok. All right. You got to throw that TikTok in, right? Uh, <laughs> BT, where can we find you at? You can find me on Twitter at Brown Chubby Bear, also on threads at Brown Chubby Bear. Um, and also you could find me on Facebook at Brown Chubby Bear. I'm Brown Chubby Bear everywhere and every and every single place there is. Um, you could also find my latest articles, which I'm currently writing one now before the preseason game on fanbattlesports.com. All right. Crenshaw. You can find me at Fifth War Crenshaw everywhere. And you can find me at A1, Day One Texans everywhere. And you can find this wonderful podcast everywhere, especially on the Fan Battle Sports Network. So make sure you check that out. Again, Adam, thank you for coming on. Appreciate uh, it. We, we hope you have a great season this year as as the Texans. And guys who who turn into Jacoby uh, Francis, he will not be on again. Uh, last minute schedule change. We had to reschedule for Friday. So make sure you check us out. Then we'll have it posted for you guys. Y'all have a good night, and we'll see you next week. All right. This is Crenshaw Briggs and VT. We want the touchdown. We're not trying to go.